Hey you guys, welcome to book review number six zero, the big six zero. Uh, to celebrate, I'm going to be reviewing Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama. Uh, a story of race and inheritance is the subtitle. So anyway, this well-known presidential author um, wrote a book sort of about his early childhood. I should say, completely true. Uh, I'm not going to acknowledge any of the conspiratorial people outside of right now because that's all a bunch of bullshit. Um, completely true story of uh, uh, his early childhood and his early adulthood. And the book is really divided into kind of three parts. Uh, the first part being his youth and uh, kind of collegiate years. Uh, the second part being um, his time spent as a community organizer in Chicago. Uh, and the third part uh, spent during a uh, visit or trip that he took to Kenya uh, to meet his extended family. Well, the first part of the book is about his early childhood and uh, kind of talks about uh, not only him growing up in Hawaii um, as well as, as a time in Indonesia, um, but also sort of how his family got to that point and uh, to use, I think, his own words, how they were just kind of salt of the earth, middle class people uh, that really kind of um, were liberals but not really in a uh, um, kind of uh, political sense, more just kind of optimists that society could produce better and weren't just cynical about um, you know man's nature if you will um, and so really the, the access he had to was more his mother's side of the family, which is, you know, he's mi uh, Barack Obama's mixed race. Um, and so she, he talked about how she was raised in Kansas. And she also talked about how, um, I believe her father, who eventually moved to Hawaii uh, with her, I think that, that, his, that Barack's mom um, was raised in Kansas, but then uh, maybe as like a teenager or something, uh, moved to Hawaii with her dad, in which case they lived for a number of years. Um, Barack Obama's grandfather and grandmother, who I believe is called Tootie in the book, I might have that wrong. I don't have a fact check stuff right here, so um, kind of going off the top of my head. Uh, they lived there kind of in a not lower middle class, not upper middle class, kind of middle class, kind of straight middle class family. Like not too many luxuries, but not really struggling that much either. Um, and she talked about sort of the war record of her uh, grandfather, uh, or no, maybe maybe the father. Um, or was it the grandfather? I don't know. Uh, during World War II, and also just how he was sort of a, a plunky go-getter type. Um, now, Barack Obama's time there was uh, kind of both spent in study, but also misspent in, well, everyone knows the Jim Club, but we're not going to go there. Well, we will go there, but just kind of uh, hanging out with friends and... Um, you know, he, he was a classic case of a very intelligent person who uh, did not fall by the wayside, but also maybe did not impl or, uh, apply himself fully uh, in his early years. Um, now, the big event that sort of broke up Barack's uh, life during this time period was his move to Indonesia, where he spent, I believe, his high school years. And he talked that his mom actually um, remarried a man, uh of Indonesian descent and then later divorced them. I believe this was her second marriage. The first marriage being briefly to Barack's father who is from Kenya. Uh, I'll get more to that side of the book in the, the third uh, section uh, when he goes to Kenya. Um, and about how uh, you know he was a good guy uh, but Indonesia was a place. The thing that I remember most from that part was just he talked about sort of the grinding poverty and sort of how there weren't any easy answers. And even in as a youth, I think he may have been in junior high or something. I think by the time he went to high school, he, yeah, by the time he went to high school, he was back in uh, Hawaii. But during his sort of uh, middle years of education, 
uh, he was in Indonesia and saw a lot of grinding poverty um, and not necessarily always just like the extreme cases but just cases where people were kind of stuck in a circumstance that they couldn't get out of um, but at the same time he also mentioned that there were markets and that was something that was different than his time in Chicago and that they had these tiny kind of markets uh, not just physical markets but sort of trade and basic crafts that people could engage in to earn themselves an income but couldn't really get out of those to have a higher quality of life um, yeah, so I think that kind of informed his later years of, uh, specifically in Chicago, he mentions, uh, you can't win them all. And I think he got that a little bit from his time spent in Indonesia. Uh, so anyway, he moves back to Hawaii. Um, and as I said, a little bit of misspent youth there. And then, uh, goes on to, uh, LA, uh, for two years of undergraduate where he meets some, um, extremist Black Panther type people. I think this is during the 1970s, so kind of like right at the end of like the late 70s, right at sort of the end of the whole, um, uh, or maybe like mid-70s, right at the end of the, the, really the protest movement. I think he was born in 63. Yeah, so maybe like late 70s. Um, but in any case, they kind of fizzled out, and he noticed uh, a number of people that while very politically committed, had become jaded and uh, were kind of um, lost in their own political, uh, not ex uh, extremisms, because I feel like uh, those people could justify their point of view. Now, that's not saying it's universally justified, but they could, to themselves, justify their point of view. But because they really weren't getting the results that they saw in their youth, uh, become kind of jaded. I remember he had a couple friends in this college they went to in L.A. Uh, that were like that. Anyway, he goes to, uh, the last part of the first section is when he goes to Columbia, uh, graduates school there, and then spends about a year kind of uh, by himself, kind of isolated from the community, being this uh, overly educated, not quite uh, applying himself type person. He talks about how he would just wander the streets of New York, of Harlem, um, and kind of know the people, but not really be part of the community, if you will. Um, and so that's the first section. I guess I should really, before I do this too chronologically, kind of discuss sort of the underlying theme of the book, uh, which is so, uh, race. Uh, well, it, it is a race, but that's certainly one of the main, main themes. Um, well, it says the story of race and inheritance this is in the subtitle, so there you go. Um, I think the, the biggest criticism I would have of the way that Barack treated race in this book is, like, black psychology, if you will. Now, I'll certainly acknowledge that, um, you know, blacks have been oppressed, and that that legacy continues today, even if there are far fewer racists, I would say. There's obviously the, the strata of the um, black community is put in disadvantageous spots uh, to primarily the white community in the United States. Um, and while I don't think that necessarily, you know, we should just go, ah, white people, you're terrible. Um, the, the, it exists. I think to say that we are perfectly egalitarian society would be a lie. Um, people need to have self-motivation, uh, but they also are born into what they're born into, which is, you know, why Brock spends so much time talking about his own family in this book, which is why, you know, you see um, it's very hard for people to come out of ghetto areas in the United States and become successful. It's it's not uh, just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps like a lot of, frankly, the Republicans would say. I mean, that's just, you, you use your power of observation, you can deduct that. It's not that hard to see. Um, though you might have, obviously, you know, you have um, counterexamples, but like the larger society is just, it's not like that. Um, but I would say that the, the greatest criticism was that while that certainly exists, and while there were times in the book that he focused on the particulars of what was going on there, he also very heavily talked about black psychology 
And I'm a little bit critical of that just because uh, it's almost like you're getting stuck in your own head. Um, I feel that that happened with some, not a lot, but some of the time in this book that Barack talked about what it meant to be a black man. And I guess it's because I'm a white person and I just don't think that often about, well, geez, this is what, what it means to be white. You know, it's just, uh, at some point you gotta get to doing what's to be getting done, you know? Um, and obviously if there's psychological, um, implements to that, that if black, if a certain black person is affected psychologically because of race that needs to be dealt with, that's preventing them from being successful in their everyday lives. But I feel that we shouldn't project upon bl all black people that necessarily, um, um, they're going to be so affected. Now, there's going to be some effect no matter what. We do have different colored skins. But to say that, um, you know, just go on this extensive psychological study for every single black person for what it means to be black, I think it's kind of counterproductive. I don't know. I mean, that sounds a little out of line, but I don't think I'm really that far out of line there. Um, and Barack does f uh, focus quite a bit on that, which... Uh, I think is negative. Now that being said, I really feel he counterbalances that and this will lead into the next section, particularly in the Chicago uh, section of the book about what is to be done. Um, and uh, while he talks about like, oh, there might be this person in this section that uh, has really become discouraged by living in a uh, housing project in Chicago. You know, the housing projects in Chicago are very notorious. Barack did not choose a plush job after receiving a degree from Columbia, a prestigious degree from Columbia University. He went to work as a social worker in one of the worst. Well, I think he did actually didn't say it was one of the worst, but it was uh, near the bottom. Uh, of what you could choose in terms of social work, let alone, you know, like Wall Street or what the majority of people do with some Ivy League degree. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think, uh, obviously, like, when he focuses on the individuals and how their psychology was affected, I think that has more resonance because then you can immediately look upon what, the circ what their circumstances are. Um, you know, for example, he talks about these kids that were gangbangers, and unlike in a Hollywood movie, he wouldn't be able to, like, convince them all. But, you know, he could slowly change just some of their attitudes over time that, not necessarily that they completely change, but maybe they just kind of drop some of the, you know, bad behavior over the course of time and maybe try to help their own, um, individual circumstance, uh, just slightly, to some degree, or just, if not be, you know, um, Ayn Rand, I hate to use that, I even hate that person, uh, at least, uh, be, uh, not a, um, negative member to society, or a, a I don't want to say drain on society, because that's wrong, but, um, yeah, and he also talked, I think, uh, I, uh, which is something that often doesn't get mentioned in the inner cities, is about the large community of people that are not violent, that are not gangbangers, these being, you know, people over the age of 25 who are impoverished, who live in ghettos, who want to stop this, who don't want to see the youth, uh, but who, because the economic circumstances aren't there, the uh, police, but not only the, the political uh, policing circumstances aren't there, um, to really kind of have trust in the, the um, police as a governing organization um, or as a you know just tr uh, trust there and it's not all on the black people it's some of it is on the police too um, that because that isn't there these people often feel powerless to the more um, kind of wild members of society um, one of the, the scenes that really stands out that I mentioned in the Indonesian thing was, uh, I'm at 14 minutes. He, uh, has a big community event where he tries to get like one of the big political HUD honchos to, uh, have a busing program. And I think in addition, oh no, it's not a busing program. It's a, uh, a job center program. So to bring like a, like a career center or a job center to this, uh, ghetto area. And he talks about how, 
Uh, this is sort of like the little thing that sets off the big thing and you can't win them all, as I was saying in the Indonesian section, about how the microphones wouldn't work at this uh, uh, get-together that they had for this high political honcho at the time. Now, I mean, we're not talking like a U.S. senator, we're talking about like an important person in Chicago politics. Um, that could bring this community center uh, down to the south side of Chicago, to this um, housing project, this very large housing, housing project area. He said that the, the mics went out. Classic. And so what actually happened in... I, I think I can say... I don't know if it's a stereotype or not, but uh, sort of classic black fashion, uh, the audience started yelling at the uh, political person, the political honcho, who was also black uh, and had come up from this area, but was so displeased by kind of the uh, rancor that... Uh, uh, happened because of the lack of uh, a PA system that they actually discontinued the or didn't even fund, they didn't even start really, the uh, proposed community center that would have brought a lot of jobs. And it was just sort of like a perspective moment because you can't win them all but also it's just sort of like the follies of life if you will. I don't know why that particularly stood out but it also, I think it was also in that there was a story afterwards that like some people um, became disassociated with the community organization that, uh, we're not talking like a career center organization, that's not what Barack Obama had, he just had kind of a uh, people organizing kind of thing that he uh, engaged in for I think two years in the, in the mid 80s. Um, but the, uh, they became so out of it that uh, they left but then it was the few people that stuck around once the numbers kind of shrunk that really rebuilt the organization after this sort of cataclysmic event and uh, although he ultimately left south, the south side of Chicago in pretty much the same state that it was when he came in you know there was still tons of violence I don't think they were even at the peak of the um, criminal epidemic in Chicago at that time period I think that happened in like the late 80s or early 90s and he's there in more like the mid 80s um he really could see the effect that he had upon individual people and how uh sometimes it's not just about like a broad demographic number but really helping um individuals help themselves but um yeah just sort of in a in a community way mm, I don't know how to describe it but it it was sort of like bittersweetly fulfilling but for those people that he did help it wasn't bittersweet at all it really was fulfilling for those people so okay I'm rambling I'm gonna get on to the third section oh uh, he also mentioned uh, just because of the political circumstances that were later developed he mentioned Jeremiah Wright uh, and the uh, importance that kind of the evangelical churches had within uh, organizing he said that uh, in an area where there was very little organizing or where there was a lot of sort of um, uh, not chaos, but kind of like controlled chaos uh, in these ghetto areas that the, the Pentecostal churches were or churches in general, and he also mentioned the Catholic churches actually, Catholic, Pentecostal whatever, churches were one of the main organizing areas in these he actually mentioned the Catholic churches quite a bit now that I think about it, completely forgot about that but also the, the uh, more Pentecostal like Jeremiah Wright type churches uh, really had in organizing the, uh, the people of this community in whatever way that they could. Um, yeah, and obviously that had political effects later on, which, I don't know, I like Jeremiah Wright. I think he's kind of a cool guy. Uh, but the third section uh, was about his trip to Kenya, and now, unlike the Chicago section, which took place over about two years, or the early life section, which was very expansive, this was only, I think, about a month-long trip to Kenya, but what it really informed was Barack Obama's black heritage. Uh, Barack Obama's father, uh, let's see how much time I got. Barack Obama's father uh, had moved from Kenya to study at University of Hawaii for a couple years uh, as part of an exchange program uh, where he met Barack Obama's mother. They had Barack. Uh, I think they got married and then later divorced. I think they were married. Um, but then they got divorced, he went to Harvard, and then back to Kenya. And uh, surprisingly, despite the fact that he studied at Harvard, 
despite the fact that he was one of the first Kenyans, actually fell on really hard times in Kenya. And kind of, uh, even though the the family dynasty in Kenya was kind of a, his dad, his grand, Barack Obama's grandfather on his father's side was sort of a local chieftain. Now, not a big honcho of the entire country, but kind of in the village he was in was um, kind of a big man. That's uh, something that often happens in African societies. you got the big man that kind of uh, dictates a lot of what goes on in sort of family relations and not just uh, extended family, too. Um, but despite being the first uh, that saw this, or that uh, was able to go west, Barack Obama's own father actually struggled and died in sort of poverty uh, circumstances. Uh, I think it was a car crash that he died in. But anyway, uh, had to work as a manservant, even though I don't think he actually graduated from Harvard, but although he went to Harvard uh, for a time, had to work as like a servant in white people's houses in Kenya, and obviously uh, slavery wasn't going on, but there was this sort of kind of white upper class and the black lower class, or the black, not even lower class, but kind of the white 1% and then the, the masses of black people. Um, and so Brock's father, or a father moved to Nairobi, the big city, to make his way, but wound up not making his way. And so Barack Obama goes back and sees this and kind of is uh, shocked by uh, these stories about his father because his mother, who lived in Hawaii, who was, if not in love with Barack's father after he left, was still kind of enamored with the story of Barack's father, uh, had always, this is the mother, had always told Barack about how great a man Barack's father was, so this was quite a shock to Barack. Um, but the thing that is kind of the silver lining about his immediate father is all of the other stories of his extended family. Some successful, some not successful, but unlike kind of the one tragic story of his dad, kind of uh, paints a larger tapestry uh, of a family. And although I think even to this day, Barack isn't super close with any of his family in Kenya, um, he does maintain relations with them, and it does kind of inform his point of view. Matter of fact, he often mentions that um, one of the connections he has to Islam, in addition to his mother, who married the man in Indonesia who was Muslim, was that some of his cousins, uh, or even I think some of his stepbrothers, converted to Islam. Now, he is not a Muslim. Uh, but uh, that gives him sort of compassion and, uh, or not even compassion, that's kind of condescending, empathy for uh, the Islamic community and uh, the way they see the world, which hopefully in our current time period really plays out because obviously there's a lot of conflict there and somebody that has that empathy, unlike somebody that just cracks the whip, I think would lead to a better world. Um... But yeah, I, what else did he do out in Kenya? I mean, he visited his family estate extensively. Um, you know, he talked about sort of his grandfather and kind of the tall tales that he always told. Um, but in general, just kind of enjoyed it. Um, you know, I think he enjoyed his time and it was eye-opening and everything you would think that it would be when you have this sudden new door open to who you are as a person through your family. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, so, Dreams from My Father, A Story of Race and Inheritance. This actually is a really good, uh, I know this isn't necessarily a travel book, it's more an autobiography. You know, I do primarily travel books more than anything. Um, but it works. Uh, or it's interesting enough because it focuses on, uh, you know, the trip he took to Kenya, his time spent going to different places in the United States and Indonesia as a young man. Um, and I think it just, uh, uh, while its primary concern is not culturally in some sort of like lonely planet travel type thing, uh, for somebody that's interested in cultures of various places, it is certainly informative um, and certainly provides a perspective and in a lot of ways a deeper perspective because you aren't just seeing like Mount Rushmore or you aren't just seeing um, I don't know the Empire State Building you're actually talking about how somebody lived in an individual spot for a time being 
And not only that, it's not like he spent his entire life just within a five mile radius in Honolulu or something. The, it moves to different areas, so it's a little travel plug there. Check out my other videos, by the way. I know that's terrible on a uh, Barack Obama, uh, Dreams of My Father book review, but do it. Okay, Barack Obama, Dreams from My Father, A Story of Race and Inheritance. Hopefully I did this book some justice. We'll see. I think I'm at 24 minutes, so I'll say goodbye. Bye, you guys. Bye.